Hi, Ricky. Okay, that's a good, interesting one. I mean, basically, um, yeah, when I was in the sort of teenager, I did sort of, I had to do the sort of cross country running, uh, running at school and stuff like that, which I sort of, I sort of enjoyed. It wasn't, I wasn't particularly brilliant today, but I sort of enjoyed it. Um, um, yeah, then after going to university, I did nothing for for many, many years. <laughs> I always love walking though in the um, countryside and, and stuff like that. Occasionally walking back from sort of like um, pubs when I was at university, you know, long distance, you know, some quite distances as well. And, um, uh, but really, um, I only got into running sort of by accident, completely by accident. And I was about probably mid 40s. And um, a friend of mine in 2011 did this sort of 60 mile sort of, it was actually walking race rather than sort of running, but there was runners in it. And um, yeah, it was quite local to to where I live um, in um, near Horswater in um, in the Lake District. And um, she did this. She managed to finish this sixty miles, and um, and then sort of like sort of they were, I wouldn't call it a bet, but sort of goaded me to say said like the, the next year you should have a go. You, you know, you should uh, have a go. But I'm not, you know, I'm not sure you could finish it or something like that. So I said, okay, yeah, I'll do it. And um, so I sort of um, went and um, went into this like sixty odd mile race and um, and and failed to do it. I got to about forty miles and I had to drop out. But I was so incensed with it because I was I was just injured. I mean, I wasn't really fit in any. Um, but I was like so incensed by it. I didn't finish this, and I felt so I was like shocked by the um, the embarrassment of it. Um, that five weeks later, I just went out and did it on my own. So I just did it on my own. And around the same time, that same that sort of same month, there was a group of people who I was also friends um, who were doing the Lakeland 50. Uh, Lakeland 50 starts from uh, near Pooley Bridge down there and then finishes in um, in uh, Coniston. And uh, they did this, and I thought actually I, I like, really like the idea of that, um, you know, because I you know, I just love walking in the mountains and stuff like that in the hills. And um, so I signed up for the, the next year, and I, I sort of. Um, you know, went down to Coniston, did the registration, then, you know, the, get the, the, the coach up in the morning, up to Dale, Maine, and I really didn't like the idea of getting the coach. Anyway, I get, get there, and I walked, I mean, I, to all the runners there, because it's all runners, mainly all runners, um, I went there wearing a pair of walking boots and rocks. <laughs> And um, I really like, did this 50 miles, and uh, I was finishing faster than some of the runners because I was just walking quickly, and I was stop I was stopping in the checkpoints. So, um, you know, the checkpoints about every eight, eight nine miles roughly, um, later than 50. So I, I sort of finished it, and um, I thought I want to do the late 100 because a you don't have to get the coaches, and b you know it's it's more of a, a trek round. This is like something which is really impressive to do that, and also the the altitude uh, range as well. So it's about I think it's about just over 100 miles, and as a, again, there's about a point more or less every eight nine miles it sort of varies. Um, but I to sort of demonstrate that I could sort of get there, get around within a certain time. So I knew I'd probably have to do some running. In in reality, you can probably get around the Lakeland 100 by a fast walk. Yeah, but I, I've always I try just to. And I, and I sort of ran, I ran some of it. I got injured and uh, I didn't finish it, but I came back the next year and did it and finished it. So I was, it was, for me, it was a real achievement. So more or less then I thought, well, I really enjoy these longer races. So I just sort of signed up for more. And that's really what started it, sort of 2013 onwards. So it's yeah, sort of eight years or so. Yeah. Oh, oh. yeah. 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 What what I did was because I live near I live near H Horswater, Leighton Fifty, Leighton Hundred goes very close past where I live. When you come off, um, for those who've done the Leighton Hundred for Leighton Fifty, you come off um, the, the hills, Bampton, coming into into Horswater. I live sort of very close to that turn off down, so I can actually see where I live. And um, 
I, I, I must say, I, I, my feet were not in a great state that first time. I got to Dale, Maine, and um, I, 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 I had pretty nasty blisters. And I, ch I changed my shoes there. And it was a bit, it was a mistake. Um, and I, I got, I've made so many little small mistakes which have had the sort of larger consequences. I mean, there's, there's too many more to say, but um, uh, I got down to, I, came, I was coming down the, the hill off to Horsewater and I just phoned home and I said, look, because Mardale, the Mardale checkpoint is the worst place to stop, I think. You know, the, you have to stay there for a long time. So I just phoned up my, uh, my wife said, look, can you just come and pick me up? <laughs> so she, she drove down. The whole, whole as well. She's had a bad time with uh, with the Lakeland 100. I can tell you, in various checkpoints. She knows more about the checkpoints than I do. Um, but uh, she, <laughs> she picked me up, and again, I was I was annoyed with myself. But um, ultimately, I, I was I would have struggled to, to to finish. I think. But in terms of the tra the training, I'd basically been training by going up and down the, um, a particular hill, and then just doing some sort of loops in the area, and that sort of um, strengthened my sort of legs and and stuff like that. So I think I was. Okay, I was capable of doing 100 miles, but um, I wasn't. I wasn't quite into it. But the next year, 2014, um, I came back and I, and I and I finished it. I've, I've um, I said I've had, a, I've had an up and down uh, situation with uh, Lakeland 100, where I've had some classic DNFs, whereas I, you know I've had um, you know one or two sort of really pleasing finishes as well. So um, yeah, so so there you go. So. Uh, Yes. So again, we'll go back to 2000. That year, I did the Lakeland 50, and I was um, I was in a meeting in Barcelona, and um, I, and in this meeting, this a colleague of mine who's uh, from Catalonia. She she said really excitedly, "This Catalan guy has run the most brutal race in uh, in in um, in the UK and and won it." And I sort of thought, I thought, well, first of all, what on earth are you talking about? Why would the Catalan want to go to um, to the UK in January? Um, you know, when the weather's absolutely awful. And, uh, and she she didn't know what the name of the race was. She didn't know what it was. But it, it turned out to be the spine race. It turned out to be the winner was uh, Eugenio uh, Rossello, who's, uh, who's Catalan. She was really excited with these brilliant, brilliant um, pitch, uh, pictures of with, with him with the Catalan flag at the end of the tears. If you know Eugene, he seems to be in tears quite a lot. And um, so uh, the, the next year, I then sort of heard this on, I think probably even on the Lakeland 100, um, you know, um, um, Facebook page, I sort of started to hear the name Spine Race. And then I looked into it, I think 2015, yeah, I sort of, I, they had the tracking page. So I was watching this tracking page on the first day because then I had to go off to travel off to work somewhere abroad. And, um I saw, um, I was looking at the tracking page on the first night and the weather in the Lake District was awful. So um, I, I knew the weather was pretty bad down there as well, uh, near the start of um, the Pennine Way. Um, and I was watching people go way off track and it was, and I thought, I've got to do this. This is just fantastic, um, you know, without any real capability. But because where I was brought up with, I was brought up in North Manchester. So I knew part of the Pennine Way. And, I mean, typically Pennine Way, if you walk it, is sort of 21 days. I think that's the sort of standard standard day. You can walk it over 21 days or maybe a bit less if you're quick or whatever. Um, and I'd always, I'd always wanted to do the Pennine Way, but there's no way I'd, I'd ever had the chance to be able to take three weeks off work or three. I'm not going to do that. I've got kids and, uh, you know, it's just no way. So the idea of um, doing this as a race over sort of five days, I thought, Fantastic! This is I'm go, I'm going to have to sign up to this, and that's what I did. And I didn't think they'd actually let me into the race first of all. So I, I, I applied for 2000. I applied in February 2015 for the 2016 race, and I didn't think they would let. Me. So there's two. There's two. There's a long race and there's a shorter race, and there was a, an even shorter race. So the shorter race is about 108 miles. The long race is 268 miles. And um, for the um, so I applied for the long race and I thought they're really not going to let me in because, um, you know, all I've got really is a background experience of the Labour 100. So I put the application in and then I put an application Which is strange. So I'm just going to, ah, there we go. Is that better? Can someone just give me a thumbs up if um, 
that's working better. Uh, sorry to bother. sorry to stop you mid-flow there. I just had a message saying that um, they can't hear me, but they can hear you. So that's the important thing, they can hear you. Um, but I'm just going to see if Nothing. that's fixed it. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be running this yourself. <laughs> I'm just going to see. If you can hear me, guys, just um, let me know. Hopefully that will work. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? They can hear you. Yay, we're sorted. Thank you. <laughs> right, sorry about that, guys. I don't know what happened there. Right, carry on, Rob. Sorry to interrupt yeah, okay. you. Yeah, I was about to say there's nothing worse than listening to me do a monologue for them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's a, the long race, 268 miles, there's a short, shorter race, which is a challenge, it's about 108 miles. So I didn't think they'd let me into the uh, the longer race, I just didn't, you know, I had a um, Lakeland 100 behind me and yeah. a Lakeland 50 and that was it. So I, 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 I signed up for that and then I decided to also sign up for the challenge of the 108 mile just in case. Um, but you had to, um, you, you couldn't click on the same name, so I had, to, I had to do another application where I had to call myself Mrs. Robert Cullen <laughs> as opposed to Mr. Cullen. So I get this, uh, I get this uh, email off the um, director, um, Scott Gilmore, saying, uh, saying, um, could you tell me what your gender is? Because <laughs> <laughs> we're do, not do sure. Do the long <laughs> so do, do you want to do the shorter race as Mrs. or the, or the long race as Mr.? So I said, well, if, I, if you can put me in the longer race, that'd be fantastic. So right. I was in, and um, and then I, you know, then I had to really think about how to uh, how to approach that uh, race because it's a completely different um, situ uh, situation to a forty-hour uh, race uh, under a mile race um, in 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 many respects. So I sort of trained by first of all, sort of longer distances just on my own and uh, yeah. sort of overnight if I could do. I did a sort of special sort of spine race training weekend, which was, oh, right. I think, very helpful. That's uh, organised by Spine, students. isn't it? Yeah. So it's people who've done Spine, and it's organised by the Spine, um, the directors, and um, and those are really key to the race. Right. Um, uh, and I really advise that anyone who wants to do the spine, any form of Spine race, even if it's the, the new sprint race, which is the 45 miler to Hebden Bridge, I would right. even sort of advise that try and get onto that. Um, because it just gives you a bit more of an experience. And then yeah. after that, I think in November time, just before the race, I then basically got a train down to Gargrave. Yeah, I know Gargrave well. <laughs> I cycle around there a lot. <laughs> I sort of basically, um, I, I sort of, uh, with a friend, um, walked as, went, went, ran as far as um, sort of... Um, uh, Penny Gent, or yeah. then she she left, and, and then I continued overnight for the next two nights on the on the Pennine Way, wow. uh, sleeping just in the um, boggy area after oh, the wow. Town Hill because I got to the Town Hill pub about sort of one o'clock in the morning and it was unfortunately closed. Oh no! Did eat so, the best um, cheese and onion pie there. <laughs> did did was this absolutely. just for training then? This was your recce of some of the route. That was the. It was, it was more to uh, customise myself with just being out in really crap weather over, right, wow. over a few nights and um, I think maybe you asked me later on um, about um, how to approach that because there, there are certain elements of the spine race which you re which really you know you get the high dropout rates for very good reasons yeah. and, um, you know, and it's to do with certain elements of the race and not just to do with the weather it's to do with all the other elements like sleeping and just being out in the open yeah. for such a long time with hardly any of course in terms of gotta, wrecking it the, how much sorry how much do you think you wrecked off the actual route then in terms of so distance well, wise I've, I've now done it several times so well I yeah you're, you're an, if shoes. anyone's doing the spine race you need to find rob he knows the way <laughs> you'll not get lost <laughs> but on your first you one lost, yeah, you might get lost still. On the first one, how much of the distance would you say you'd actually been out on the course of to yeah. get your bearings? Not, not, not a lot. No. Um, I did that section from uh, Gargrave to Dufton, which I could say is probably, well, it's probably like maybe a quarter of it, probably even less than that. I did. Uh, I managed to do a section of it um, from the start, um, just up to the Finder Scout, because I've never, I never sort of done that part for years. Yeah. And and that was that was more or less it. So I was I, I so for the first time I very much did have to rely on the, the map navigation yeah. and and the, the GPS 
because a lot of it's at, at night time as well. I mean, the majority yeah. of it's at night time in, in the winter race is completely different yeah. than summer race, of course. So you really do have to rely on, uh, on on sort of navigation skills. Or what some people do is they just hook themselves onto someone who's clearly good at navigating yeah. and just follow them. You do see that quite often. So, How easy um, is it so, in terms of route finding that particular um, race? How easy is it to, fa- to route find on the spine? How much is on well-marked sections? I mean, the... the I mean, there, there are sort of um, finger posts anyway, because it's, it's a national trail, so yeah. there's, um, there's quite a lot of those. But there are also quite a lot of um, finger posts pointing in the wrong directions as well. Right. There's like the there's classic Oldham Way, yeah. where people quite often miss the turn. Um, so you've really got to be you know, on, on your wits to, to keep out looking for um, where, these, uh, where they turn out. So you, it's really advisable to really sort of work out, you know, look at the maps and get a good idea of, um, of, of where the, you know, the terrain and uh, ideally if you can wreck it the whole thing and I know some people yeah. do manage to do that, wreck it over the period of a, of a year. Right, Absolutely, wow. um, you know, that's the best advice, text on photos and stuff like yeah. that, so you've got something to refer back to. That's a good idea. Um, so the one of the one of when you did the spine in winter 2017, was it, that you didn't finish... Is that right? Yeah, no, so 2016 was the first I didn't finish. Yeah. But you were so near the end. Yeah. So you're, you're, it was, tell us where you were up uh, to on that point uh, when you didn't finish on that race because it, I mean, you'd done like most of it, hadn't you? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was pretty much, um, I was pretty much at the, the um, by the sort of second checkpoint at Halls, which is about 100 miles in, 108 miles in. Uh, I was pretty much, I think I was the last person to leave the checkpoint. Right. So, um, and I, I mean, I, I get injured quite easily on, on some of these races. I mean, in recent times, I have not been too too bad, but I, yeah. sometimes I really do, uh, you know, get injured. And um, and I tr- sometimes I do the right thing and pull out, and sometimes I decide to soldier on, and I end up just destroying myself. Yeah. And sometimes I, I'm... I'm good enough just to keep going. So I was pretty much injured, and I was I was also not used to the uh, the, the sort of third day out. So yeah. That was this was really new to me. So, um, so I got to um, near um, not so far from Dufton, and I needed to I really needed to sleep. So I got my I took a small tent with me for some of the sections, and I slept out for what ended up about five hours. Right. Wow. Uh, near um, this big reservoir, um, Cow Green Reservoir. Um, and uh, woke up in the morning, and my my shoes are completely frozen. I had to heat up water, you know, you know, boil uh, boiling water into my shoes to get and managed to get them back on again, and um, and and head off. So I was at the back of the race, but with with that five hour sleep, I was managed to catch up, overtake right. and catch up with people. But um, by the time of getting to um, Hadrian's Wall, um, it, it was uh, we knew the weather was changing quite drastically in. Yeah. Um, over the Cheviot Hills, which is the sort of big risk area of the whole yeah, race, and yeah. like everyone's tired as well. And um, I was with two of the two of the people, Sarah Fuller and Harsh and Gill, um, and we were together. And we we pretty much came up with a plan of how to finish the race. And we we got to Bellingham, the, the, the last last major checkpoint. Uh, had something to eat, and then was ready to go. And we were told that the the the, the cut off point for the last. Um, to get to Burness, which is the last point before you go over the Cheviots, um, was um, reduced by six hours, and that much more or less put us in such. A, there's no way. There's no way you could get there unless you called Ian Keith. You could probably got there in time, but we couldn't. We, no, we could do it. So we we basically just continued anyway. Yeah. And um, as we got to the the sort of mini checkpoint towards uh, Burness, the, the directors were waiting for us oh. in a in a lay by. And the the lights came on, and they said, "Look, you know, you've got to come out of the race." And uh, ah, gutted. So, <laughs> my wife, my wife and kids were driving up to Kirk Yetham for to meet me the next day. Yeah. And um, and I'd been on the phone for saying that, that they want to take us out of the race, but I'm going to continue on. <laughs> I'm going to go with the Cheviots. And uh, she said, "said right, just wait five minutes. I'm going to I'm going to stop the car and driving. Yeah, and I can tell you now it's snowing on the roads. Oh no. So watch the car and phones me back and she says." You're doing what? So I said, uh, I'm, I'm going to continue this race. She said, no, you're not. 
get in the car and you're going to drive home. You're going to drive to Kurt Yetton. So I, within a, within an hour or two, I was like back in Kurt Yetton in a pub. Yes. And, and I was sort of soul destroyed, but I was in a way relieved. Relieved as well, yeah, yeah. But that, that, you know, from then I was definitely going to come back the next year and I came back the next year. Completely different conditions. Right. First, First day, very fr- very much frozen, lots of snow, yeah. all, melt- all melting. So you were wading across um, streams, wading across. Right. It was quite, it was quite um, you know, interesting. You could you could call it. And um, your feet were freezing, then thawing out, freezing, then thawing out. But then it became very mild, and it became a very much easier race for the, for the right. second half. Of it. And um, so this 2017 was, with respect, a lot easier and. Um, right. And, that, and also you've got the experience as well and yeah just and you know you, know, you the, knew um, most of the course as well by then really <laughs> didn't you apart from the tiniest well, section at the end in the meantime i did then i did um, go over the chariots then yeah to, check out to the bit that you haven't done previously wow and um, so the, the spine is a race that a lot of people i think aspire to do I, i've never aspired to do the spine i, I couldn't think of anything worse um, because it, it's epic, isn't it? I mean, it, it's a massive um, undertaking. And I don't know how much time you would say you actually spend on it running as opposed to walking, as opposed to walking quickly and things like that. Um, in terms of running and walking, how is it kind of um, done? How do you kind of pace yourself when it's something so long? Yeah. Yeah, right. So that's a, it's, it's a really good point because um, I mean, if you actually do the calculation, the the winter spine race is 168 hours. You've got to finish in 268 miles. That's only that's only 1.6 miles an hour, which yeah. is nothing. Yeah, it's, it's all about it's all about really how you handle the sleep, how long you, you spend in the checkpoints. Yeah, um, and the longer you're in the, the longer you're in the race, the more the sleep deprivation has an impact. So if you're one of these people coming in three, three days, four days, you have less of the problem of the sleep deprivation. Uh, okay. um, but you know, rightly so, you deserve to um, to win because you've nailed it. Yeah. So you, you, you're, more, you're more or less, if you're in the top sort of um, 10, 20, you're pretty much running um, you know, most of it. of it. But yeah. I would say I'd say when you're coming down to the 15, 10, 15th place, you're more or less running really much slower. And, yeah. um, you know, you're more or less walking the hills and... Um, and uh, you know, it's painfully sort of uh, trotting along. Um, so for those early ones, I was probably running for. Um, I would say, what I found was I was probably running for about sort of um, the first sort of uh, say twenty odd miles, and then sort of then getting in, then becoming injured, yeah. then walking a lot of it because also the, you know it's so muddy and you just yeah. slip. Yeah, depending on what shoes you're wearing as well. I mean, yeah. you can be, you know, if you're wearing the wrong shoes, and that happened to me. A number of times. We're going to go on to kit because I think that's when a lot of people are going to want to know what on how on earth do you pick your kit for a race like that? Yeah. So you slip, you slip, you can be slipping around all over. It's very easy just to slip somewhere and you've injured yourself. Yeah. What I found is that in those, those first two races where I slept for um, quite a long period, about halfway through, around the Dufton area, yeah. 2016, I slept for five hours. 2016 I slept in an area where there's no mobile phone signal so no one knew where I was on the track for six hours I meant, to, I meant to stop for 30 minutes and I forgot to set my alarm and I just slept for six hours wow. in, in under the stars it was fantastic wow. uh, but then afterwards I did that six hours of sleep I was running yeah. you know, so I, I managed to run more or less all the way to Hadrian's Wall you know and I, I, the, the pain I'd had in my legs was almost gone because just having some sleep. Some sleep. It's, it's very like tactical, a- isn't it? it? It's you can sit there and you can talk about the tactics of doing a race like that and planning out how many miles you're going to do, how much you're going to run, how much you're going to walk. And I suppose it is a lot of it is is figuring out your strategy, isn't it, for a race like that? How are you going to actually tackle it? Yeah. So I, I, I mean, everyone will tell you. Apart from if you, you probably, I think even the winners who made basically the race race strategy does change at times, yeah. depending on who else is racing against you. Of course, um, certainly, um, I, I've I've always had a plan of where I want to be, and um, and, and usually it's injury, which is then sort of um, yeah. still that. But I've been pretty consistent with the, the timing. I mean, this 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 summer, two thousand and twenty. Um, I sort of set myself the task to try and get in, in within five days, 
mainly because I wanted to get to, to checked in at the hotel and have a, have a beer, basically. Um, and I managed to do it in about 117 hours. So I managed to, I managed, and, and that involved really quite a lot of um, trotting along. Yeah. Um, you know, even at the end as well, I, I, I was absolutely destroyed coming over the um, the Cheviots because I was just, I was tired, but also the impact of the, the sun you know, over, over a period of days was, was really, really affecting me. I managed to get 10 minutes sleep at the, uh, um, one of the, because I don't know if you know, over the Chevet Hills, um, in the summer, there's hardly anywhere to hide from the sun. Yeah, it's very it's just, open, isn't it? You can't find shelter. Yeah. But there's two mountain, there's two mountain refuge sorts, and at least you can either go in one or you can sleep. I can just try and just go behind the back in the shade. Yeah. And I got 10 minutes of sleep, and then I managed to more or less run the rest of the race. Right, wow. So, yeah, and um, three days earlier, I there's no way I could, uh, you know, I was... Right. I, I was having to walk and I was you know pretty sleep deprived and a lot of it so much comes down to the sleep deprivation so yeah. this balance is um it's good to have a strategy of where you know and having a realistic strategy as well of course and trying um, to work out how much sleep you can manage without for you so personally I, I'm guessing it's different for each person isn't it that, that's quite hard I think it's, di it's different between summer and winter as yeah, well yeah yeah um, certainly um, I know what I'm capable of doing in the winter space, <clears throat> winter spine, if I um, remain sort of fit. Yeah. And I do the right shoe choice. Yeah. Um, tell us about kit then, in a minute. Oh, God, you tell me yourself yeah. about that. I'm intrigued. Yeah. Um, and I know pretty much now what I'm capable of uh, of the summer as well. Yeah. Uh, so um, I know that's the case. But if I'm injured, then I'm injured. Yeah. Uh, and... So it changes from time to time. In 2000, the winter 2018, where I think I was well capable of getting in within 130 hours, I did become injured and I sort of realised, right, you can finish this, but you really going to need to slow, slow down. down yeah. Accept it's going to be painful and, and just take the pain and just do it sort of sensibly. And, um, you know, I, I managed to finish. I got to Bellingham checkpoint and like one of my thighs was one and a half times the size of the other oh, thigh, no. complete. And I and I just took it easy. I, I yeah. finished um, finished within the time, and uh, in the end, it was, it was the most enjoyable race I've, I've done. At, you know, in, in all of the yeah. uh, spines because I was able to sort of take it easy and yeah. um, have a bit more rest and, and stuff like this. Fabulous. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the weather and the impact of the weather has on you um, with regards to the summer spine and the winter spine. Um, one of the things I want to mention is food, first of all, um, and fueling. Um, obviously, for both events, it's quite different, isn't it? Um, some people, with food, you all have your own preferences as to what you eat, what you can eat, what works well for you, uh, and what doesn't work well for you. And it's only by trial and error that you figure that out. Could you talk us through what you have in terms of food on a winter spine and what you would have on a summer spine race, just to give us some indication of your fueling strategies? Right. So uh, winter spine, because it's if it's going to be really cold, I mean, you just you're just piling down the calories. It's very, really advisable to um, you know if you're sort of tapering the week before, um, which you really should be, I suppose, under a race like that, is uh, you really need to start you know to start to. Eat. Build up some with yeah, eat. I like the sound There's of this now. <laughs> so many people who have fallen foul of um, you know just running out of um, you know per, uh, in, in a yes. fuel yeah. um, toward the end of the race and then become hypothermic. It's it's really quite um, it's really quite amazing, really. So certainly, um, you, you know, it's not a question of just like losing weight for the race. Yeah, you need to actually you need Lover to have up. those reserves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get some up, reserves in place. It can be so cold out there, and yeah. up on the hills, you can, with wind chill, you can, there's been times um, where it's been uh, minus 15, minus 18 degrees wind chill on, on some of the hills in a spine race. There's food um, at the checkpoints, isn't there? There's hot food at all the checkpoints. There's, there's, yeah, the checkpoints is more or less once, one, once, per, it, it, more or less once per day if you're finishing within six days, more or less. Right. So you're getting more or less one hot meal per day and there's big snacks and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but you need, you need to have, um, well, part of the kit is um, you need to have some like 3,000 calories with you. Right. A certain, to, you know, with you, and uh, there's a good reason for that. Yeah. So typically what I would take for a uh, winter spine is I, what I did for, depending, if, depending on how cold it is, I was like, um, I came up with the idea, and I'm, I'm not sure if other people do this or, or not, I'm sure, some of them do sorts. I get sort of um, 
a bag of um, salted peanuts. I put into the bag of um, a, a bag um, a chocolate raisins, yeah. all mixed up. And if it's cold enough, I put sort of chopped up feta cheese. Oh, right. Or halloumi cheese is a good one as well. Yeah, yeah. Now, never work in a summer spine. <laughs> no, no, it would be a congealed mess, wouldn't it? <laughs> You just like look like you've had some like sort of dirty protest. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, but that really works for me. And right. uh, and, you know, and I then I do take uh, this sort of uh, tra uh, trail wind um, yeah, powder, which uh, two hundred calories in a. So I have that with um, water. Yeah. Uh, I need to keep uh, and, uh, hydration as well. If you bear in mind that yeah. a lot of berries are lacking uh, natural water, and um, uh, you need to um, keep well hydrated. Um, which sometimes isn't isn't so easy for no, this. Not, this, it? this spine it was it wasn't too bad. We were restricted at some um, places where there were water drop points. Um, we were restricted to 500 milliliters of water. Right. There were quite a few drop points um, of water um, where sort of um, the safety team would be. Um, but uh, in the 2018 race, which was very hot conditions, and I, I'm it's surprised even now how I actually finished it yeah. because. Of because of the heat, um, um, it became really quite um, difficult. And, and then um, the medics were coming around, really sort of insisted that you had water. And be right. before coming up onto the Cheviot Hills in 2018, um, I was I was basically more or less forced to take up um, um, three and a half liters of water, which is wow. three and a half kilograms of water. Yeah, that's a lot, isn't it? I, I tried to explain to them that if I take three and a half kilograms of water up with me, I'll have, I'll have um, sweat Lost off. three and a half kilograms. <laughs> Um, but I, but anyway, there was, you know, luckily we managed to get through through all of that. And there were some streams where you could just stop and just sit in the stream and just cool off. Do you drink yeah. from streams at all when you're doing a race like that? Do you take a filter bottle or anything? I know some yeah. people do. I, I've not um, actually taken a used a filter on, right. on in 2018 and this year as well. This year and the Chevitz was quite difficult in, in the heat. Um, Unfortunately for the people behind me, it became a really bad pour, pouring down weather. Uh, oh, so right. rain. But certainly, um, it was. Um, it was. Um, I got water from a a, um, uh, a stream, which you know yeah. the water was clear. Yeah. And I uh, put half a uh, chlorine tablet in. So you, yeah. you, it's a good idea to take some chlorine tablets just in case. Um, yeah. you know, not not heavy. So. Yeah, that's a so, good tip. So the main, the main thing for the um, for the winter races is, is really having. Lots of calories, you know, yeah. more or less eating. And um, what's the best food um, at the checkpoint? I know there's a. I've got a picture of you somewhere. I'll see if I can find it uh, with you in your cheeseburger. Um, there's a picture here. Actually, I've just popped a picture up of you um, doing the spine. There's a couple of the winter pictures here, just showing people um, the conditions, and it, you can hardly even tell it's you. <laughs> You're just all covered in black uh, with sort of ski goggles over your face. Um, and then there's another one here that I'll just pop up as well. 2018 spine, I think that one was from. Um, if you're just sort of coming down uh, one of the paths there off the hillside covered in snow, uh, just to give people an idea of the conditions and things. And there's a, a lovely picture you sent me of you with a cheeseburger wrapped up in foil, I think, as you left one of the checkpoints right. as well. So, so the, the, there's another few points to make then. So there are the, um, the the five main checkpoints. You can go into shops if they're open. In the right. winter, then that's not so easy. If you miss it, it's not open. So there are shops. There are a couple of other places where where there are food as well in the in, in the summer and also the winter. So there's uh, an additional the Craven and um, and Thornton uh, Triathlon Club put in a, a small sort of mini station which um, they were giving people cheeseburgers and bananas. Right. Wow. That's good. And. Um, and there was, and you, you can. Some pubs will allow you to go in there. You can order food. You can now drink a little bit of alcohol. You, you know, previously oh, right. banned. As long as you don't get completely trashed, you know, it might make it better. It might make it more bearable. I think. <laughs> in um, this year, I did, I did have a pint in um, in Lothersdale, a pub in Lothersdale, and then I did have a can afterwards. But then I needed a power nap about half an hour later. Yeah. Um, so. Um, so you can go into cafes if they're open, they allow you in pubs. So there are that's available to any, anyone. So it's just the the, the the racer. In Dufton, there's a cafe, uh, penny, um, post box cafe, which is um, pantry cafe, which is um, open more or less. They open for the whole of the spine race period. Right, they open right. to the fortnight, 
48 hours. Are there people on through. route to give you food and drink as well? Are there people, is there support on route from people coming out to help? Yeah, as long as it's available for all people, then it's then, then it's also all races, then it's considered a, um, right. and, uh, and to the, so there's some uh, famous cases that um, there's um, in um, Gary, Gary, Gary Go, which is um, after Crossfell, there's um, usually some people there who, um, you know, will have a cup of tea or, um, yeah. you know, to, something to eat. And um, in Slagford as well, um, Natasha Newsom, she, yeah. um, so she was there. Um, some, I think she's been there for a few years as well right. for, um, for the race. So there's, there's, there's definitely um, uh, people who then sort of um, come out and, uh, and so, you know, support all the races. So it's really, that's really good. Brilliant. Um, the yeah, so the, the subtle difference between winter and, and summer is uh, really for the summer it's hydration. Yeah. Um, the conditions are different in a way. The summer can be for me more difficult because um, you've got changes in temp rapid changes in temperature yeah. quite often. We, the hills can really change. Um, you've got insects insects biting you, so you've got to, you know there's a con that's condition as well. Yeah, whereas you're more covered, aren't you, in winter? And um, uh, and um, you know, of course, it's more. It's, you've got 17 hours more, 17, yeah. 18 hours of light, of light, light as compared with darkness and the, yeah. the, um, for, the, for the winter. So that's the, the difficulty there. Yeah. In terms of kits, and this is this is always a good question, and there's always lots to discuss <coughs> over here. Um, what would be your sort of kit tips um, for someone um, doing the summer spine and kit? tips for someone doing the winter spine uh, we like talking about kit on wild ginger running um, um, what would be your so it doesn't have to be brand specific but what would be your specific your things that you would recommend to people um i think uh well there's the the, the kit list anyway which is you have to do the two of them yeah uh, in terms of um the winter because you need really to consider that um your feet size will expand you will get swelling in the feet you quite see, often see these photographs of people, of uh, spine racers sleeping with their feet raised above yeah. their heads, you know, on the chair or something to keep the swelling down. And this is um, this is advisable. Nice. Um, so, um, so basically, having more than one pair of um, shoes is a good idea. And the second pair of shoes being the size bigger, bigger or two, even size size and a half bigger, or something like that. Right. Uh, some people take three pairs of shoes as well. Now, uh, winter it can be icy. Icy slabs um, can be can be quite difficult as well. So you do have to, as a kitless, you do have to take these mini spikes. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes those are absolutely. Uh, you can easily slip off one of these um, yeah. slabs and you and you've you injured yourself and that's it and that's it. So that's you out, isn't it? Uh, spikes. I've I've had to use the the the, the, the spikes. Um, yeah, tracks in one case, I think, yeah. or something else, some other micro spike type of thing. Another case, um, I've had to use more or less any time, any winter race, it's been really, really cold. Um, but then there's also the cases where it's just really muddy, and therefore yeah. you want something really good grip. Yeah. And you know, there's these, um, you know, any sort of running shoe which has got the good mud, mud um, grip is yeah. really advisable, you know, for certain parts of the race. And, but you want one with uh, good cushioning as well, don't you, when you're running that distance and often yeah. that's a compromise, isn't it? Well, um, that in this summer where the ground was quite hard because it's been sort of baked, there's been some rain, yeah. but it's been respect to um, so I think there's a lot of cushioned um, soles and people running around yeah. with. So, you need to just um, you know understand what the terrain's like and um, and and just a, a, adapt. But do to take a at least two pairs with you right. without. A, um, it's a good excuse to buy multiple pairs of shoes and tell your partner that you need them for the spine race. You need three yeah. pairs. Do, do you use get, poles? Do you use poles in the winter one and the summer yeah. one, or both? Right for the. the this this summer, I used the poles for a short period of time and decided I just didn't need them, so I, right. I just I. I used them between, uh, for I think between the second checkpoint and the fourth fourth checkpoint, yeah, Middleton. So I used them for more than one and a half two days, and then I just dropped them. I just didn't need them, and they were in fact they were becoming a pain. In the winter, I I would always take them out with me because, especially at night time as well, and you can't see you know exactly what you're doing. And you're using them. To, you, I use them more to check out the um, the terrain in front of me, and you know you know if that. If where, where there's a missing um, 
um, slab of a uh, missing slab, sometimes you put the pole in and it will go right down. Yeah, so yeah. You, whereas you may think the pole is just on, uh, sorry, the slab is just underneath the water surface, you know, quite often it's just sunk straight into the, yeah, um, the peat bog. Yeah. So um, I just, just purely from a safety To help with balance and, and things like that. They're a real pain to handle. Um, yeah. Poles. Some races, of course, where the where poles are banned as well. The um, the um, the long last race, which is the um, north of north of um, North Wales to South Wales, um, you can't take poles, but you right. don't really need them. To. There's a so, question um, just coming about um, spikes. Um, that do you ever use the screws with the? Do you ever use shoes with the spikes in, or do you always take? I think you take the micro spikes, don't you, that you just attach yeah, to the bottom of your shoe as and when you need them flip off. Yeah, in, in theory, um, you can just like put them on, take them off when you need yeah. to. In practice, after you've um, been four days in the freezing <laughs> cold, and any arm um, movement involves like sort of um, spasm for some Yes. <laughs> it can be quite amusing sort of seeing people trying to get these things on because yeah. you've got to stretch them and you're losing yeah. all the... Yeah. So, um, there could be an advantage to having one spikes, but I, I, I don't think... I've ever seen anyone wearing them. I could be wrong, but yeah. um, I, I think the having the ones which are replaceable, um, yeah. the um, the Atrax or something, yeah. I, 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 I was good, good for, the, for the purpose, yeah. Yeah, it tends to be ones that you flick on and off rather than the shoe with the screws already in, but thanks for your question, that's great. Um, so head torches is another one. Um, do you, and, and uh, GPS was the other one I was going to ask about. Do you take a watch that records your whole route or not and how do, are you interested in things like that do you try and record where you've been or what do you do yeah. with that yeah well some of these um, um tracking um, companies um you can get the um the gps um, downloaded afterwards um yeah. so there's usually some um there's, there's usually some um what i do with uh, i i there's watch where um, it records every once per minute so it actually under records the distance yeah but it gives me some indication of time and, and distance and um, so for example the uh, okay in terms of kilometers it's 430 kilometers to the spine race it recorded me as 405 kilometers so it lost oh. it to the 25 <laughs> but that's it in picture but it, but it lasts for 200 hours with a yeah. single battery so, um, yeah. so that's that's the only rationale for that a lot of people wear the the garmin watches these days which has the gpx on and um, there's other watches as well um so they can they've always got the the the, the um the, the reference for the winter spice you winter spine you have to take a gp a handheld gps right that's the, part of the kit so there are various models uh, again and uh, all the gpx files are available yeah see, yeah same out. same with labor and most races provide a gpx these days anyway so yeah uh, yeah so oh, yeah. certainly becoming more and more popular i think as the battery power gets better for yeah they're, they're, i mean they're, they're amazing aren't they now they're lasting so much longer you can just store the whole the whole thing around yeah and, um, you yeah can, you know, so makes the navigation so much easier Oh yeah, definitely. One of the other um, questions that I think is worth talking about is um, how do you train? Because um, Rob works away a lot. Um, he's based in um, Holland for a lot of the time. Uh, and so in terms of training, how do you fit in training? You've got the Lakeland 100 in a couple of weeks. How have you been training for that over this last sort of few months? Right. Um, well, the training for the late 100 was the spine race. Right. <laughs> in, the, in the summer. <laughs> Should be the other way around, shouldn't it? <laughs> spine, race, spine race finished um, three weeks ago. -ish. Yeah, I think I finished like, three weeks on the Thursday. Yeah, so wow. three weeks tomorrow. Um, I and I had, uh, I did the same thing in 2018. I did the winter spine, the summer spine, and then the late 100, and I finished all three. And I think I did something else in between as well. I didn't need to do any training between all three races. Right. Um, and, I, and I got my fastest time on the Lakeland 100 as well, which is remarkable. So it kept me fit. Um, this time, um, well, sort of going one st step back, you say the fact that I work away. Um, yes, I mean, I don't get much um, opportunity to, to train in Holland. Or, yeah. And I'm usually, usually in a non-pandemic situation, traveling yeah. quite a lot for the work I do um, within, mainly within Europe. So I, I really don't get the opportunity to train. So you kind of um, use because, your races for training, yeah. yeah. Because of, um, because of um, um, 
because of the situation with quarantining in the UK yeah. and in Holland, um, I decided to stay here for sort of three weeks. I go back on Friday, and yeah. then I've got the whole series of PCR tests, and um, I should I should be um, okay for the for the race next next week. But because I stayed over a weekend, I did thirty kilometre thirty five kilometres uh, up the coastline, which is very oh, flat right. here in Holland. Do you work on time time on feet rather than distance generally for training? Anything on feet is good. Uh, yeah, I mean, I sort of, I, I usually try, I, I usually go for a sort of certain distance. So I usually have, I, I'll usually run multiples of 10, so 10, 20, 30, 40 kilometres. Um, and the training is generally is, is running, it's not walking. Um, right. Uh, so on this occasion where I've been in Holland, I've managed to run up the coast and uh, I could tell you, I could barely walk for three days afterwards. Uh, because, because it's flat and fast, is that why? After the spine race, I mean, I, I oh, just yeah. let myself go. <laughs> <laughs> I just spent three weeks just uh, just taking it easy and, and doing nothing. So it was a bit of a shock when I finished, um, I, I got to... Um, I got to the end of this run and um, I, I realised that oh dear, I mean maybe I'm not as fit as I used to be. Anyway. <laughs> but um, I think that would be enough now for the um, for, for the, the late run. Uh, yeah. Probably have to do. I'm not sure if I do have to do the quarantining in the end because of the job I do. Right. Um, but um, in which case I will probably not do any training um, before the late run. Now just tape up. It's not a good idea to be doing much before. Um, before, so typically when I'm um, away and returning home most weekends, um, I will do. I'll be hardly doing any training, and it's usually right. you're at the race to train for the next one. What I do is, if I would normally go out on a Sunday morning about four o'clock in the morning, wow. four until something like four until seven or four right. until eight in the morning. Um, the subtle difference this year is because I was um, before um, during, because of the pandemic. Um, I was able to telework from home for right. um, the best part of 16 months. So for the first time, I was really able to actually do some training for the spine race. So I did spend something like three weeks of doing 10, 20, 30 kilometers, right. more or less continuously um, for three weeks, every day, every day for three weeks. So wow. I was more... And covering. generally early morning, is that kind of your time to train normally early morning or in this case early morning or really late at night mm. so that you so, don't hamper family and think work too much as well so I was, I was covering of the order in terms of kilometers i was covering the order of um sort of 120 kilometers a week right, wow. three weeks, and then i tapered for the last week right. and i did i did go to uh edale um so sort of three days <laughs> early which is a long story um, and I did, uh, I did, you know, go out for a few hours just to check out how light it would be, um, because it was more or less near the solstice. Yeah. How light it would be over, over the Kinder Plateau after Edale, just to get some idea of um, of what sort of distance I could probably get before it went dark um, yeah. on that film. You've obviously got a very, very supportive family um, who help you and are keen to support you in these crazy events and picking you up when you need picking up in the middle of nowhere in the snow. Um, and, you know, having friends and family who support you and help you out and things like that, um, you know, I'm sure that's it, that's a really beneficial uh, thing to you. Um, and, you know, with work and things like that, do you have to book lots of holidays in order to fit your events in? Is that how you tend to do that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the events, if it's over a week, uh, or, or in some cases, um, you know, I can't do the event. So I, I one year did the Spine Challenge, the Winter Spine Challenge, because I had to immediately disappear off to Germany. Right. And um, I did, I managed not. I managed not to finish that because I was I didn't myself. Right. Um, there's a, a video of me walking down um, the corridor of Schiphol Airport in Holland. Yeah. Um, you know, this long one mile um, tunnel basically, and I was like, it took me about three hours to walk down it because I was completely destroyed. Oh. Um, so um, I, I think I basically uh, yeah take, take the holidays. Um, yeah. But I, I prefer the long the longer way if, if I can do it. So. It's, I usually I'm trying to sort of do maybe one or two longer races and then yeah. other ones are usually fitted in over a weekend so yeah. late in the weekend it is a weekend. Do any of your children run? Are they keen on their running as well? No, they think I'm completely bonkers. Do they? <laughs> <laughs> so you've not you've not inspired them yet to take part. They, 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 
they are, um, you know, when I have to get picked up, oh, you, you, they sort of joke that I was DNF to go. Um, you know, so I started the spine race. And so, um, yeah, but you'll have DNF in a few days' time anyway, just to wind me up. I can imagine. You know, I've, there's a lovely picture of just... you after the Northern Traverse um, with two of your children. Uh, that I've just popped up on the screen there where yeah, they've but... obviously come to meet you, I think, at the end of um, that race. Yeah, well, that, that was a good one because um, because um, they really wanted to see me at the end of the race, oh. and but I was very close to the end of the race, so I had to sl I had to slow down um, for the last uh, sort of twenty miles. I had to slow down so to get I had to wait for them to travel across the country so I could finish when they were there. Oh. And in the end, I ended up sitting up for like three hours. Um, oh, no. so when I actually got to the end of the race, I could not fall pints. <laughs> so I finished the race and then we fixed. Smile on my face and big uh, smiles uh, couldn't feel anything in your and, legs. And, and I didn't quite come last, but I was more or less at the one point. I was when I was in the pub. I was looking at the tracker, and watching uh, people, people just go past you. Saying, yeah, they were saying, "Oh, yeah, we've been we've been looking for you, waiting for you to arrive, you know, for, for the last few days." And uh, you know, it was, that was really interesting. But I could see the the last people pass the pub, and then thought, "Right, okay, finish the pint, and then, and then well, I've got a job to finish now." Oh, I, just, I just got there. And just got there in so time was, to meet was, them. Uh, That's fantastic. I really, I really enjoyed that. So another race which goes within a within a mile of where I live. Oh, is it? And. Um, this coast to coast um, walk race, right? And um, and uh, yeah, it's a difficult one just going past home. And you think, uh, should I really be at home with the family, or should I be out um, destroying myself? We know what it's like when you're so, running. You never plan a route that goes past your house, do you? Because it's too easy to stop if you do that. So yeah, you've, you've done well there. Carrying on. Um, a couple of other questions for you. Um, injuries, illness. Um, and do you do cross training and things like that? Because um, I think often a lot of people who suffer with injuries try and do some cross training, some biking and other things. Um, and obviously you're covering massive mileage. So in terms of your training and cross training, is it all running that you do and walking or do you do any other sports as well to kind of help with that? Right. So, um, yeah, sort of recovery in a way as well. Um, so um, in one of the later 100s, uh, I did made the big mistake of um, get, getting a small injury and deciding I was going to finish the race and just um, slowly over a period of um, probably 40 miles got worse and worse and worse and worse and um, to the point where I got to the Kent Mayor checkpoint and I couldn't even get stairs. I was in absolute, oh, no. um, absolute agony. So I had to get picked up. Um, so um, what I then, and I really was um, out of, uh, I mean, 10, 12 weeks. And right. what I did there was I, I basically went swimming to 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 try and um, you know help with the um, with, with um, recovery. So it wasn't cross training as such, but it really sort of helped me recover. Right. I wouldn't normally um, do much cross training, but um, certainly I live in an area where you can go biking as well. And um, I think maybe as I sort of get older it'd be more likely that um that i would probably go biking um as much as um doing the running in the mornings yeah. i think yeah yeah just to sort of even yeah, things so out a little bit and do you see a physio regularly or do you do any sort of stretching work anything like that specifically or do you just wing it and hope for the best <laughs> i think i have to do, i have to do stretching because otherwise i could <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have to do stretching these days. I've got, got to that age where um, you know, you just got to do it. Um, as physiotherapy, no, I, 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 I'm sort of too lazy for it to. I, I know it's probably I could save myself weeks and weeks of uh, recovery I think, yeah. to see a physiotherapist. Um, um, again, maybe in the future, but no, certainly it's not. It's never really um, no. happened in the past. <laughs> Um, we've got a lady out called Hannah who's watching who's got her first Lakeland 50 next week and she's just entered next year's Summer Spine Challenge so she's really pleased that you're here uh, tonight and says you're, you're the perfect guest for her which is great. Um, so I was just wondering if you had any hints, tips um, and advice for people um, on these sort of events because actually I said earlier on I would never want to do it but actually listening to you talk about you know, the tactics and things like that, I thought, mm, maybe at some point in the future it will be something I would look into, possibly. <laughs> yeah. So 
So any hints yeah, or I tips mean, for us? I mean, at Leyland 50, it's, a, it's just a question of um, follow the crowd and, uh, and um, you know, en enjoy it. Hopefully the weather's good. It can be sometimes, um, it can sometimes turn. I mean, it's in Ju end, of, end of July. So, um, so um, I mean, I've been here to where there's been, it's been hailing, um, yeah. you know, hailing and coming off. Um, so you, have to, you need to um, be prepared for it to end uh, the weather to turn. Um, but other than that, um, the checkpoints are not too far apart. Uh, you know, there's a every sort of eight nine miles. There are some big climbs. I, I hopefully you've wrecked it. It's worth really worth wrecking. It's probably too late to do it now. But um, but you know, just persevere um, and um, you'll get there. Because at the end of the day, there's a lot of other people who are struggling as well. And if you really start to really start to struggle, just uh, think about what your objective is. Your objective is to get to the end. You know, you've you've got so far it's just a question of just taking it easy don't panic and um, and you, you'll you'll get there if you stick with it keep keep at um, it keep at it speak to other people as well because there's, there's um, you know there's other people probably in the same similar situation to you as well if you if you walk at the same speed or running and um, just uh, you, you know you speak to people and it takes your mind off things and the other thing is um you can quite often be in the situation where what can be what can feel like a you know a pain which is going to get worse can sometimes just disappear when you think about something else or ch chatting to someone or listening to some music or just taking your mind off it and um, can just fit. also um do do stop at the checkpoints if uh, you know if you feel you know you can go into a checkpoint destroyed and just a little bit of a rest if you can get somehow get some some of these places difficult to get a seat but um certainly if you can get to sit down somewhere just take a bit of a rest get something to eat have something to drink and it's remarkable how um how you can uh, recover and as i've said on the on the sparring race a 10 minute sleep at the um, you know um at this at the, at the side of the path 10 minutes will completely refresh you it's remarkable you don't really need to sleep so much in the late in the late 50. Yeah. for the challenger um the difficulty of the challenger um it was it the winter challenger or was it summer uh, summer um, because there was a subtle difference to summer okay so the, the again the you've got the first day which is about 45 miles and the second day makes up to 108 so it's about 60 yeah 60 miles or something like that second day that second day is a long long day and you've got to prepare yourself for it because there's no checkpoints you'll see if right. you know there'll be this um there's sort of mini checkpoints, but there's nothing. There's nothing special. So you've got to prepare yourself for that long, long push. It's going to be light for most of the time. So there yeah. is that. Um, and again, I think if the weather's good, um, it's going to be great. If it's, but it can it can turn. And um, you and you know do stick with the um, the, the the checklist. And I think the, um, the sorry the kit list. I think I've heard already that the, the kit list for next summer may change compared to this year because of some accidents which have occurred. Right. This year, so you need to be prepared to be. If you need to stop, you need to keep yourself warm. If you're if you're up in an exposed area, like exposed area, you really need need to be able to keep yourself warm and you know have some food, something to keep you com comfortable, both mentally as well. I think you know you should you know to listen to music and yeah, phone people up as well. Yeah, again, that's a good idea. <laughs> this is very good for. Um, you can find yourself in a spine race where you're on your own for days. Right. Especially if your name's uh, Ian Keith or Anna yeah. Chief. <laughs> where you're on your you're on your own foot straight from the start, more or less. Um, but um, in the middle, in the mid pack or towards the back, you will you will um, meet people and yeah. um, and you will find that some people just want to just uh, focus on it and just to get it over. But some yeah. will Chats more than happy to chat, and some will be. Some people can be quite clingy as well. Because yeah, yeah. Not a navigation. You can't shake people off very easily, can you, on a race like that? Unless you suddenly say, "Right, I'm a, I'm picking the pace up and hope they can't keep up." <laughs> but it's a bit hard when you've done a hundred or so miles, isn't it, to change that? <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, well, I think that's pretty much everything covered, Rob. Um, I've really enjoyed speaking to you tonight, and um, I've learned a lot. And as I said, I'm I'm kind of quite inspired myself to maybe try and get back into um, a bit more ultra running and things like that. Certainly, talking to you is is give me your enthusiasm and made me think that yeah, maybe it could be something I could look at in the future. 
Yeah, go for it. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining me, Rob. Uh, thank you very much to people who are watching at home and thank you very much for your questions and things like that. And uh, thanks very much and um, we will speak to you soon.